At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Pray with me. Father in heaven, I pray for this time. I pray as we hear from your word, would you open our ears and would you touch our hearts? Holy Spirit, I pray, would you help me preach in a way that's helpful and that's accurate? Uh, And God, I, I pray that this would be a meaningful time for us to draw near to you. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys may be seated. Well, welcome. Welcome to those of you here in the room. Welcome to those uh, who are online. We, we now are proud possessors of a live stream, which is exciting. Uh, we have people traveling or sometimes they're just, you know, housebound, can't get out. Uh, and this week, actually, we're very excited uh, for our friends in the frozen tundra of Siberia. No, just kidding. The frozen tundra of Tennessee uh, getting to join us. Uh, they've had crazy temperatures, lots of snow and ice. And so uh, just in an abundance of caution, we have decided to do just a live stream in Tennessee rather than a service. So hi, Tennessee. Uh, Hope you're surviving the minus temperatures. Yeah, Linda's waving. I appreciate that. All right, so we're in in, uh, Matthew 12, and here would be my, my question for you. How many of you grew up in a religious home? And and I did too. Okay, good number of you. Uh, Now, how many of you had all kinds of rules that your parents kind of like, this is is what we do? Right here, yeah, same. Anyone had rules about Sunday? No? Okay, okay, Angela did, a couple of you. I, I certainly did. It was crazy. It was like, okay, it's Sunday. You don't get to play with your friends. It's like, What? Yeah, no, no, you're staying. Actually, like we're going to go to church at 10. It's a little Lutheran church at the time. Uh, and then we're going to be at church from 10 to 11. If it's 11 or 2, we're all leaving. Doesn't matter what the pastor is saying. We're out of there. And then we're going to have lunch at just 1130 sharp. We'll be done by 1215. And then you go into your room until 3 p.m. Okay, Nate is like, he's like, same. All right, and like, we're just like, I'm like, this is, this is terrible. I hate Sundays. Sundays is the worst day of the week, right? And then like, all of a sudden, I think my parents were like, well, we, we know this is not in the scriptures. Uh, eventually, our kids are going to be old enough to know this is not in the scriptures. And so we kind of abandoned that whole thing. But it was something that I grew up with. Now, maybe you grew up with rules, and you're like, those are not in the Bible, And maybe some of you have never figured this out because you don't read your Bible. All right, so here is your friendly yearly reminder. Read the Bible. We have three hopes for you this year, okay? Number one, get into the Word. And you're like, I'm not even a Christian. No better time than to get into the Word. Get into the Word. If you need a reading plan, if you need a strategy, if you need some help, we'd love to help you. Number two, get into community. 
The Christian life was never intended for you to do on your own, okay? You need to be with other people and do life with them. So we would love to get you into a community group. Talk to any of these men that you just saw up here. Talk to Pastor Emerson. We would love to help you get connected, all right? And then number three, intentionally invest in, pray for, believe God for your sphere of influence. All right, so those are the three things we're inviting you into. Uh, that was a side note, and I, now back to religious household. Uh, here's what's funny. If you grew up in a non-religious, irreligious household, I would venture to say you had as many rules. I, I guarantee it. You had rules about, in this house, we vote Democrat. Like, oh, yeah, of course. What sort of, of course. In this house, we drive Ford, GM, whatever, right? It's just like, you, buy, you bring one of those European cars home. Oh, no, 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 none of that, right? It's just like, oh, man, right? For, for us in Germany, it was like, yeah, you buy a German car. Like, none of these Japanese cars. We're not doing that. It's like, you know, Volkswagen and BMW and like, let's, let's go. Opel. None of you have ever even heard of Opel, right? But that's, like, that was... There was different rules. Imagine what it would be like. I mean, like even in Seattle, it's like uh, you drive an EV. You show up with your big SUV, uh-uh. You're in violation of our city code, right? So religious rules, religious, uh, you know, guidelines, commandments, legalistic righteousness is not necessarily something that is just restricted to the religious. It's something that we all are going through. And I think you probably know what I'm talking about. Now, here's something that we need to understand. If we can get ourselves into a place where, yeah, our family had rules, or, yeah, the, the people I hung around with, we had rules, both spoken and unspoken, you're a step closer to understanding the Pharisees. All right? Because they had a ton of rules. And those rules... Lo and behold, it had nothing to do with Scripture. All right, today we're going to see Jesus clashing with the Pharisees, and he's clashing with them over the subject of the Sabbath. Now, in Judaism, like if you look at the Talmud, which is their kind of interpretation and their commentary on the Old Testament, there's 24 chapters just on the Sabbath day. Over 600 commandments relating to the Sabbath day. And if you didn't follow them, then you were a violator and you needed to be dealt with. Wow, crazy, right? So the Pharisees, they, they were religious, they were devout, they wanted to do well. I really actually believe that many of them had good motivations, but kind of in the course of time, they became the religious watchdogs over Israel. And man, like, you know, we hear today about watchdog groups. Those are not the fun people. Let's just be honest. They're like, there's rules and regulations and you're breaking them all. So we need to, uh, you know, we need to get after you. How do you become a legalist? Well, a couple steps, some easy steps for you to consider if you want to become a legalist. Number one, make some rules that are not in the scriptures. All right. Like, it's like, well, how do I know? Get into the Word. Read the Word. Okay, number two, then set yourself up as judge, jury, and executioner regarding all those who break your rules. Okay, that's really, really important. You've got to be super judgmental. Because, like, unless you're really judgmental, you're not going to be a good legalist. All right, this is, just, I mean, that's the rules. Okay, then number three, and this is important. If you feel like you've been really good following all the rules you got to pat yourself on the back. All right, that's like next steps. Like, yep, I am awesome. No, right? But that's the way into legalism. You make up rules that have nothing to do with Scripture. You enforce them on yourself and on others, and then you compare. If you're doing well, you get proud, and if you're failing, you become dejected and broken and despairing. Now, that is the conflict that we have today as we approach this story. 
It's the, the old problem. It's religion, legalism, and faith. Which one do we follow? Religion, man's quest for God, ultimately always is a bunch of rules and regulations, right? Th that's how it works. I mean, if you look at Hindu uh, society, if you look at Muslim faith, if you look at the cults, uh, even like some very legalistic parts of Christianity, it's all about the rules. And then legalism is self-righteousness. I obey, therefore I'm accepted. I do all the right things, therefore I am loved by God. And then a step further is I do all the right things and now God has to bless me. And then all of a sudden you find out, wait, I'm doing all the right things, but man, I still got sick. I still experienced hardship. I still, I don't deserve this. What, what is happening? And many actually turn away from the faith because of what they've been sold is just a bunch of nonsense. And then there's faith. Faith is saying, God, you are right. God, you are right. And all your rules are ultimately loving and they're designed for my freedom and my flourishing, right? And so when, when Paul says, man, the whole law can be summed up in this, love God, love people, what would honor God? How do I do that? What would love people and, and care for people? Let's do that. That is saying, okay, God, I believe you and I believe that your rules, your commandments are for my flourishing and for the flourishing of all those around me, all right? And so faith is very different. And then the, the next thing faith says is, God, when you say that Jesus took the penalty for my sin, when you say that Jesus is the one who set me free, I believe that. And I want to put my, the, the whole of my hope in you, Jesus. All right, so this is essentially what we're talking about today. All right? If you're hoping for, hey, let's talk about what can I and can I do on the Sabbath, this is not it. If you're like, what is the Sabbath for the Christian? This is not the sermon for you. All right? This is religion versus faith. Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Let's go to the first story. We have three sections. The first one uh, I've entitled In the Grain Fields, simply because the text says they're in the grain fields. So it's, I wasn't all that clever. It was right there. Here we go. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to plug heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So what do you have? You got the watchdogs. Where'd they come from? Right? Jesus is walking through the grain fields with his disciples. I mean, were they just kind of like popping up? Like, you know, you got the standing grain, and they're just like... Aha! I don't know. But all of a sudden, there's the Pharisees. Now, I, I talked with a couple people in our team. Um, when I was a kid, there were grain fields behind my house, and so we actually did that. We, we plugged the grain, we kind of like rubbed it to get the outer shell off, and then we just popped it in our mouth as a little snack. Uh, and some of you are super grossed out, and then some of you grew up in the country, and you're like, yeah, I've done that. Right? That's what the disciples are doing. It's just like, hey, I'm just going to, oh, look at this, lunch. I mean, it's just like a drive through right? Like, it's just like, oh, here we go, lunch on the way. It's perfect. But the Pharisees are like, uh-uh-uh. You are violating the Sabbath commandment. Why? Because when you pick it, you have reaped. And when you rub it, you have threshed. And when you then bring it, like you kind of like get it ready for your mouth, you have prepared a meal. And all that is unacceptable. What? You're like, that's crazy. Yeah. Let me give you some more. If you wear a coat, according to the Talmud, you're good. If you carry your coat, because you got hot, you took it off, and now you're carrying it, <gasps> you're carrying a burden, Sabbath violation. Yes. Like, if you go 3,000 feet, you have gone to the edge of how far you're allowed to go. But if you were clever, then you put some food at exactly 
2,999 feet. You would grab the food, eat the food that's become your home, and now you can go another 3,000 feet. You're going to just plan ahead. That's all it is. Like, if you were in, like, a town, and there were some smaller alleys, you would get some rope, string it from one house to another. You know what you've done? Created a door. You're now in a house, and you can go as far as you want. This is brilliant. And there were rules upon rules upon rules that had nothing to do with Scripture. Nothing. Like, none whatsoever. See, the disciples, they weren't violating the law of God. Right? The, 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 the Pharisees are like, they have done what is not lawful. You and me, what do we think of? Oh, Old Testament law. There's probably some obscure law like, you know, don't boil the kid in its mother's milk. There's like something where don't pick the grain in the grain field on the Sabbath. Or maybe you're like, oh, they've stolen from their neighbor, right? Like when I was uh, living over on 17th, our neighbor had raspberries. And all the, the kids coming home from school would just pick them, right? Whatever is through the fence. Oh, man, they got so mad. Like, they put, like, big signs up. Uh, right? Like, it's like, oh, you're stealing my raspberries. No. They're freely available in the alley as I go to my house. Like, settle down. Here's, here's I got a verse. Right? If you're like, I, I don't know about this. I have a verse. Let me show it to you. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, okay, grain field, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. Okay, so you, no instruments were used. The disciples were completely within their right to do this. And yet the Pharisees thought, it's breaking the law. It is, does not correspond to our beliefs. What, what is the Sabbath about? Well, let's go there too. Exodus chapter 20. Let me read it for you. It is all about honoring God. Ten commandments. Here we go. Here's number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son, your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. That's the commandment. What do you do on the Sabbath? Rest? Enjoy yourself? Enjoy your friends? Enjoy your family? Cease from doing what you do on your work day. That could look different for all kinds of people depending on what your work is. But what this is all about is, hey, you were slaves. How many days off do slaves get? Not many. And God says, every week, I'm going to give you a day to rest. A day to remember that I freed you from this yoke of slavery. Every week, I'm going to give you a day to sleep in. A day to be with your family. A day to celebrate. A day to worship. A day to remember how good and gracious and kind I am. That's what the Sabbath is. And the Pharisees are like, we should make that not fun. That is really, that is what we need to do. Like, this is just all together too gracious. And if people believe in a gracious God, then we can't control them. We need them to be afraid. And so you have these Sabbath commandments, and they are a mess. Now, here is what Jesus does. Jesus is in the grain field, and he's like, okay, let me, let me defend myself. They're saying, you're breaking the law. And Jesus is like, no, we're not breaking the law. Let me defend myself. He goes defending himself with three different snippets. The first one is a story about King David. The second one is a passage about the duties of the priests in the temple. And the third one is just a verse out of Hosea. Actually, if you're taking notes, it's Hosea 6, verse 6. Let me show it to you. Here's what's going on. He said, have you not read? Which is awesome. Jesus is being very sarcastic. He's talking to the people who had, like, the law memorized, right? He's just like, these guys were absolute professionals. It's just like, have, have you not read? Have you not heard? Is this new to you? Am I the only one actually reading the Bible? I mean, like, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? Oh, we're talking about David. King David was one of their favorites, right? It was just like, I mean, it was Abraham, and then it was David, 
What did David do? Well, the story is found in 1 Samuel. David was fleeing from Saul because Saul tried to kill him. And as he was fleeing, he came to the tabernacle. And he's like, my men are hungry. I'm hungry. I have nothing to give them. And he went to the priest and he said, do you have any food for us? We're on a, on a mission. We've got we to gotta go. We've got to move speedily. Do you have anything for us? And the priest said, like, well, the only thing we got is like the bread of the presence. These were 12 loaves representing the people of Israel, the 12 tribes. And the only people that were allowed to eat it was the priests. He is King David. And he's like, yeah, that'll do. And he ate it. And all his companions ate it. Jesus is like, yeah, God never condemned David for it. Why? Because human need is greater than your regulations. Is it, and we will get there, what Jesus is saying is your regulation, your rules, your legalistic concepts are nothing when compared to kindness and to goodness and to care for the, the, the person. And so Jesus says, hey, have you never read? Now he entered the house of God and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat nor for those who were with him but only for the priests. David did it. Here am I, doing the same thing. Uh, Now he said, or have you not read? Again, he's making fun of them, I think. In the law of how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and yet are guiltless. If you look at uh, the commandments, on the Sabbath, the priests had to prepare double the sacrifices. Not just what was done on a normal day, but it was double. Do you think that's work? Yeah. Getting an animal, slaughtering an animal, like, you know, just getting it onto, like, kindling a fire, that was like, you know, oh, man, kindling a fire, that's definitely illegal, right? And they, yet, they worked and worked and worked to honor the Lord. And despite the fact that they broke all those commandments, they are guiltless. And then he goes to the next one, and he says, now, I tell you, Something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, what is Jesus saying here? He's using an example from King David. He's using an example from the priests and the temple worship, the cultic ritual. And then he's quoting one of the prophets. I think what Jesus is saying is, I am the rightful king in the line of David. I am the great high priest. And I am therefore the mediator of the new covenant. I am the final prophet. Now, now what did those, those three groups do? The king ruled. And Jesus is saying, I am will rule. The priest mediated, prayed for the nation, offered sacrifices for the nation. Jesus said, actually, I am bringing uh, the final and perfect sacrifice. I will mediate in a better way than any of these priests ever could. If you're curious, like, how does that work? Read Hebrews. And then finally, he said, yes, as the prophets have foretold, one like Moses, a prophet like Moses will be raised up. That's me. What did a prophet do? Declared the word of the Lord. And Jesus says, I am declaring with ultimate finality and authority the grace and the mercy and the love of God. So Jesus is our great king. Jesus is the great and true high priest. Jesus is the final prophet declaring the word of... He's not just... Speaking the word of the Lord, he is the word of God. Wow. What does he mean when he says, man, the priests in the temple, they're they're doing all this, and yet something greater than the temple is here. The temple was a, a symbol of God with the people, right? There's God's realm and there's our realm. And there's an overlap, right? The scripture talks about that. 
And so the temple, first it was the tabernacle. Uh, I'm actually reading all about, like, all the details of the tabernacle in my Bible reading plan right now. That seems somewhat redundant, but, you know, I'm hanging in there. Uh, but so, right, the, the, the tabernacle first, and then the temple that Solomon built, it was that place where the presence of God dwelled. It was that place where people came to be with God. And Jesus is saying, I am better than the temple. I am the manifest presence of God among you. And I'm not just in one place, but wherever I go, I bring the presence and the grace and the goodness of God with me. And wherever my people go, my people bring the presence and the goodness and the mercy of God with them. And so Jesus is there. He's saying, man, you don't get it. Something greater than the temple is here. And then he goes on and he, he says, man, I wish that you understood what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's not about your legalistic righteousness. It is about you coming to God in faith and God pouring his mercy and love on you richly. Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Man, that's crazy. He's greater than David. All right? He actually, like in one of his interactions with the Pharisees and scribes, he says, so how is it that David calls the Son of Man, the Messiah, his Lord? He is greater than the temple because he is the manifest presence of God. He is greater than the prophets. And he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath because as God, I not only gave the commandment, but I define it. We saw that in the, in the Beatitudes, if you remember, right? He's always like, this is the commandment. Now let me explain what it means. Let me show to you how to properly apply it. No wonder they wanted to kill him. I mean, like, think about it. He attacked everything that they held dear. Right? It's just like, oh, man, like our commandments, our legalistic righteousness, that is what we are just hanging on to. And Jesus says, man, no. I'm bringing a new word. I'm bringing a new reality. I am bringing the presence of God to you. So that's, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. It's still the Sabbath day, by the way. And here's the next verse. We were in the grain fields, now we're in the synagogue. Which, by the way, this is awesome. So Jesus has conflict. What do you do when you have conflict? I don't know, do you, do you tuck tail and run? Or do you go, we should have more of this? Depends on your personality, I guess. But like, right here's what Jesus does. He doesn't run off. No, he is like, Oh, like I found a few of you hidden in the grain fields. I wonder how many I can find in the synagogue. All right, so he's just like, okay, let's go. He went on from there, so from the grain fields. I guess they're just at the outskirts of town. Now they're getting into town, and he entered their synagogue. He goes right to the heart of their religious system. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Oh, look at them. It's so precious. They're like, they want to know. They're asking Jesus questions. Now, read the next line. So they might accuse him. Oh, okay. See, these people didn't care about the guy with the withered hand. He'd probably been in their synagogue every single week. They're like, just move aside. You're not productive. Go. And then, oh, Jesus, is it lawful? They didn't want to know what he thought. They wanted to find more reason to trap him, to accuse him. When you come to Jesus, do you come with preconceived notions and ideas so that you can sit in judgment on what you perceive Jesus to be about? That's what these Pharisees did. So they're like, hey, is it, is it lawful? Now again, they had all kinds of rules. On the Sabbath, you could save a life, but you couldn't make someone better. All right, so like you could put a bandage on someone who is bleeding out, but you couldn't put oil on the bandage because the oil, that is medicine, and so we might make you better. That's a fine line to tread. It's like, how, how do you do that? It's like, oh, I'm going to keep you alive, but I can't make you better. 
tricky, right? I mean, see, this is how absurd their Sabbath notion was. You've got to understand, legalism, then as now, is always ridiculous, all right? Uh, my daughter has been in, in Israel for these last few months. Uh, I had the chance to go visit Israel a couple years ago. But th it's interesting, the Jews there still, it is very, very law-abiding, right? They have timers for all their lights because you can't turn a light on on the Sabbath. And so the light pops on, the light goes off. They have, I mean, I don't know, like the first time I bought like a new stove, it came with Sabbath mode. I didn't know what that was. I had to look that up. It's like, what is Sabbath mode? That is exciting, uh, right? So there's an elevator, right? And so the elevator actually stops at every, every stop in the hotel, right? So like you have a high hotel, 12 stories. It's just like st number one, number two, number three. It takes a long time to get anywhere. But that's the Sabbath, right? Because you can't, you can't push that to make it go. You can use it. But you can't actually manipulate it. So this is still happening then. They're like, no, no, no. You cannot heal. Because this guy clearly, he's been here for weeks, maybe months, maybe years. We don't actually care about this guy. We just know he's been here. He's not dying. <sighs> really? As a man with a withered hand, he's got some disease, maybe an injury. He, he can't do his profession he can't use his hand to hold his child he can't use his hand to carry out his job and these guys are just concerned about trapping jesus ah oh, religious people they're the worst so they're like is it lawful and he said to them verse 11 which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Now, some scholars believe, some commentators believe that actually there was a, a law, a rule. I couldn't find the rule, so maybe that was on me. Uh, but that said that if your sheep falls into a pit, you're allowed to lift it back out. That was apparently not considered burden-bearing like carrying your coat. All right, which, yeah, there you go. Uh, so, and so he's like, hey, if you have a sheep, you lift it out. See, clearly these guys had transitioned from where they'd been during the time of the Maccabees. During the time of the Maccabees when Antiochus attacked, there's a story where they attacked on a Sabbath day. And the Jews, rather than defend themselves and break the Sabbath, a thousand of them just allowed themselves to be slaughtered rather than violate the Sabbath. So that's, that's kind of like the backstory. These guys clearly have graduated from there. Not only are they not letting themselves be killed, but they're like, man, my sheep might die. This is like an economic hardship. I've got to do something about this. So there were rules that they could do that. And Jesus says, man, you do this good deed for sheep. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He's like, you are misunderstanding what the Sabbath is all about. You're all about cultic, religious observance i'm telling you it is not about that it's about kindness and goodness and care and love so jesus goes on and he says this he's like man stretch out your hand and the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other he, he demonstrates by his power that he actually, in fact, has the right to say all these things. He's like, you, you want to see that I have the right to define what the Sabbath law should be? Be healed. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Not if they should destroy him, how. They should destroy him. So take note. Apparently, healing on the Sabbath, that's a big no-no. Plotting murder on the Sabbath, quite all right. Come on. That's where we're at. All right? So Jesus now, he, he has demonstrated his kindness. He has demonstrated his, his mercy to this man. He brought healing. And so Matthew now says, well, because of this plot against him, 
This is what Jesus did next. And so Jesus, verse 15, aware of this, withdrew from there. And many followed him, and he healed them all. Man, imagine being a part of that. Wherever Jesus went, he healed them all. The blind, the lame, the broken. Jesus heals. Jesus brings mercy. Jesus brings wholeness. Man, what a joyous, what a joyous time that must have been. Just imagine your friend who's been suffering for as long as you can remember, and they come to Jesus and he heals. The people that you've seen, maybe on the street, maybe like in the village, it's like, oh yeah, that's that's so-and-so, they can't walk. There, there they go. Think about it. This is incredible. And so Jesus healed them all, but he ordered them not to make him known. So he's telling them, don't, don't, don't spread my, my fame around. I want to be able to continue doing my ministry. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased echoes of Jesus' baptism, right? My beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Man, I don't know if you've ever seen a reed. If you bend it, It'll never be straight, right? But Jesus is, is seen as gentle, seen as kind, seen as merciful. He doesn't snuff out. He doesn't break. He doesn't destroy. He is the healer. He's the king of mercy that is walking through the town. How awesome. Isn't that incredible? It's until he brings justice to victory. Justice will be served because Jesus is going to die for all the sins committed. And he will bear the penalty and God's justice will be served. And God's love will still triumph. Right? At the cross, the justice of God and the love of God they meet, and they meet for us who come to Jesus and ask Jesus to forgive give us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, in, in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Jesus says, I am that good king. I am that merciful king. I am the one who brings justice. I am the one who brings mercy. I am the one who heals. I'm the merciful king. It's interesting to me that Matthew has just talked about Jesus' offer. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And now he tells us multiple stories about the day of rest and the conflict it caused. Jesus is still offering. Come, I will give you true rest. A Sabbath rest. A rest from your labors, a rest from striving, a rest from the legalism that is put upon you, a rest from trying to justify yourself, a rest from trying to figure out how can I appease the wrath of God and finding out I never can. See, Jesus says, I appease the wrath of God. I carry the judgment that has been rendered against you. I bring forgiveness and life to everyone who would come to me. And he calls, come to me. Come, receive my yoke. Come, receive my love. Come, receive my mercy. And so I think what, what we have in, in this is the offer of Jesus to each one of us. He says, receive the rest that I offer. For some of you, you have striven so hard, you have battled so hard, you have worked relentlessly 
to have God accept you. And what you need to hear today is you are loved and accepted if you have come to God through Jesus Christ. In Jesus, there's acceptance for you. Through the work of Jesus, there's forgiveness for you. You do not need to strive anymore. Ah, that's incredible. Receive the healing that Jesus offers you. There's some that are going to need to hear this for their spiritual healing. There's some that need to hear this for their emotional healing. But Jesus says, I have healing. And I, I even, like, may, there may be some of you who are like, I have this physical ailment. Is there hope for me? James 5 says, if you're sick, call on the elders. Have them anoint you with oil. Pray for you. We'd love to pray for you. If you're like, oh, man, I, would you pray for me? We would love to pray for you. Jesus brings rest. Jesus brings healing. Jesus brings hope. For the ones that are broken and think there's no repair for me. For the ones that are just barely smoldering. There's no fire. There's no spark. Jesus has hope for you. And I think there's, there's a final invitation for us. And that is, I talked about how the temple was kind of this overlap. God's space and our space. And when Jesus came, yeah, Jesus was that overlap. He was the presence of God manifest among us. But he would go to all these places to all these people that might never go to the temple, that might never come and actually find that moment of connecting with God. And when Jesus died and he was resurrected and then he was talking to his disciples, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and bring that rest and bring that healing and bring that hope and bring that new life into every sphere that you can go and touch. You think, you think you live what you do by accident? You think you work what you do by chance? Do you think you have the friends and the sphere of influence that you do because you're so clever? No, it's because God has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. He wants to invite you into his mission of bringing rest and healing and hope and Jesus to the people all around you. I think that's the invitation. That, that's what Jesus invites us into. Away from religion, away from legalism, and toward faith in Jesus. Would you receive that today? We're, we're going we're gonna to respond to this message. And, and there's going to be a couple things we're going to respond in. We're going to sing to Jesus and praise him for who he is. We're going to witness a baptism. That is so awesome. You know what baptism is? A first step of faith saying, I believe and I'm going to obey Jesus and I'm going to publicly declare my loyalty, my love, and my allegiance to King Jesus because he has given me rest. He has brought healing. He is giving me hope for the future. Yeah, maybe there's some people that need to be baptized. There's, hey, let's figure this out. Emerson is ready, I think. You ready, Emerson? Yeah. You got, some, you got some towels? You got some shorts? The first day back, but I think you got it covered. He's got it. Here's, here's the point, guys. There's an invitation to you from the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray. We're going to celebrate communion. We're going to see a baptism, and we're going to worship Jesus. Amen? Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he has come to give us life. He has come to bring us mercy. Father, I pray for those that are heavy laden, would you give them rest? Those who are broken physically, emotionally, spiritually, would you give them healing? Those who have lost hope, would you give them new hope? For the free us from legalism, from legalistic righteousness, that of others and that of ourselves. Oh, how often this is self-imposed. 
And Father, I pray that we would run to Jesus to experience his love, his rest, his healing, and his hope. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.